Greetings and welcome. Today we're going to continue working on our big 24 by 36 inch painting and specifically we're going to focus on the trees in the background and the foreground. It's a very tree centric episode but one that I think you'll find a lot of use in. We'll talk about how to make trees look farther away, how to create a lot of extra depth in them, how to create that texture, and how to make them continuously diverse. But with that, if you missed any of the past episodes where we worked on the sky, the mountains, the distant water, the foreground, you can find links to all of that in the video description where you can also find all of our tools, materials, everything we used to construct this painting. With that said, if you support the channel over on Patreon, you can also download the reference photo as well as all of the traceables. I find this really useful. I personally drew it with the traceable and I paint on the reference photos and then I paint on the canvas. That way I can kind of test my colors before committing to them on the canvas. So I highly recommend going and downloading those, printing them off and using them throughout the painting process. It just, it helps make things significantly more precise. Size. With that though, I would also like to note that this is done with acrylics, but you can use oils. A lot of the techniques are very easily transferable. I mentioned this at the start of all of these episodes, but you know, you never know who's just kind of stumbling in and finding these and you know, we all, we all have our preferences. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you have a great time. Also, before we begin, here's just a very clean shot of what we are working towards here today with our big trees and our small trees. And now with that, let's let's actually get into it. So we're going to start here today working on this larger tree, which you can see an image of right here. So I've taped my three reference photos to the canvas as I generally do. That way we can test our colors on this before applying them to this tree. And so I can see all of the little intricate details on the edges that I might innately not think to put in myself. So to preface all of this, if you look over to this tree, you might see a little bit of an underpainting and that's that's because there is a little bit of an underpainting, but not, not intentionally. I started painting it, I realized that there was a better way of teaching it, so I covered it up and now we're going to do it again and you are going to get the best possible lesson you can. With that though, while all the tools and materials will be listed in the video description, I would like to begin by noting our palette. Here I have a Mars Black, Titanium White, sap green and burnt umber. Here I have a one inch flat headed brush and I'm going to use this because it has a really nice sharp edge which will be great for working on the base of our tree trunk. So I'm going to begin as I generally do by making sure the tip of my brush is nice and damp. This will condense all of the bristles so that they stick together so that I can get really clean sharp lines. Then I'm going to head over here to my palette and I'll think, what color is a tree trunk? I think a lot of us naturally innately think of a brown, so I'll start with a little bit of a, a brown here. And then I look to the reference photo and I say, you know what, that looks pretty dark. We'll get some Mars Black, maybe use about half that of Mars Black just because it's such a strong pigment. You can still see hints of the burnt umber in there. Now I'll grab a little bit of Titanium White to thicken the pigment and to brighten it up just a little bit. There we go. Now when I go to apply this, I'm going to begin at the top and I'm going to work my way down because when I first apply it, I'm going to have the most precise stroke and it's going to progressively run out of paint and as it does, the stroke will get larger because you'll have to press the brush into the canvas more, the bristles will expand more. And so when you want to create the most sharp, clean stroke, start when you have clean paint on your damp brush. So I'm going to begin right up here at the top with just a tap of my brush. And then I'll do a little bit of a drag down, tap and a little bit of a drag, just like that. I know it looks quite small there on video. We will do a zoomed in shot quite soon, but I wanted to show you the entirety of the length happening right here. So I'm progressively doing this tap and a little bit of a drag. This is making sure that the trunk here is always changing slightly. It isn't a perfectly straight line, which is actually what I want. I want it to be a little bit more interesting. I want it to have little curves and bends. I want little areas to look like they're heavier than it. others, like different branches are kind of pulling it in different ways. And that's going to make it as natural as it can be. 
And as you can see, I'm moving down and I'm not necessarily trying to make it wider, but it's definitely getting wider and that's just because I'm running out of paint so I'm having to apply more pressure again with my brush. It's creating these larger applications and I'm no longer able to get that detail that I initially wanted at the top. But down here it's okay because it's meant to get larger. We're meant to have something that kind of tapers as it moves upwards. So it's okay if it starts to flare out. I generally begin by trying to mark in the center in the middle area just because I like to have room to make it wider. I like to start with something thin and then I like to expand outwards because it's easy to make something expand but it's difficult to make something taper because if we want it to be bigger we just paint more of this brown on the edges, right? But if we want to make it smaller then we have to remix whatever colors are out here on the sides and then apply those. Now I'm applying this paint here as you can see with a bit of a tap and a stroke and in the more transparent areas you can see that it's creating this texture and this line work and that's actually really nice. That will look like bark a little bit later on when we have some additional layers. So I'm okay with that. If you have some of the paint kind of bunching up and creating these higher little mounds, it's not a bad thing at all. Here I'm trying to fill in this bottom area. As you can see I'm using the corner of my brush for the detailed areas. But then I'll just make sure that that taper looks natural as we come up and that it does progressively get smaller but not too quickly or over too long of a period of time. So that's the start, but of course it's a semi-thin layer because we use so much water, which is a good thing. It made it, it made it sharp, but it does mean we need to go back over it again. So I'm just going to mix some additional paint here. Mars Black, Burnt Umber, Hint of Titanium White, And at this point we can really start wherever we want because the top is quite thick because we applied it when we had a good amount of pigment and it's the bottom area here and the middle that need those additional applications. So here I'm just going in, I'm just doing this little tap and drag, it's creating this slight bark texture and it's all quite dark because it's going to have a lot of foliage casting shadows around it. So we're not looking to create a great contrast or change in value. We're looking for something consistent and with a little bit of texture baked in there. Now it's also important to consider what area light is coming from. It's coming from this way. So this side of the tree might be a hint brighter and for that we'll just take a little bit of extra burnt umber, a hint more titanium white. If you grab too much apply the rest to the edge there. You can see it's just a little bit brighter, not significantly, but it's a hint and I'm just going to apply this via a tap to the right hand side. It's going to be quite subtle. You're not really going to be able to notice it to a great extent, but it's one of those small details that does help improve the painting when you really look at it for quite some time. And of course we'll be covering up a lot of this, but it's nice to work in there's slight highlights, there's little details that, in the end, are great for the people who really do care to take some time to look at your painting. But with that, I'm actually quite happy with the base. We are now going to zoom in up here. We'll start working on the foliage and we'll have some fun with some detail work. So I'll move the camera in a little bit closer. That way you can see those details as they progress. So here we are a little bit higher and now we can see the detail work in this quite well. I'm going to be using this smaller flat headed brush. It is about a quarter of an inch and I'm going to be using it because it can create these really nice little sharp lines and impressions that are similar size to this quite comfortably. So I'm going to begin by making sure that it's quite damp. The water isn't going to be in the shot here just because it's so high up. but we're not going to be doing anything different. So I'm going to begin by making what I generally assume 
foliage to be, so I'll start with a little bit of green here. Get a little bit of titanium white, make sure that it's nice and thick. Hint of Mars black. And as you can see, the foliage here, it's quite silhouetted because it's on the opposite side to the light, so it's, it's really quite dark. So I'll make it a little bit darker, like that. I'll kind of test it in here. I think mine is slightly darker, but I like that because my painting in general has a slightly higher contrast. So I'll take this and I'll look for all of the little impressions and movements here in the foliage. All of the things that I naturally wouldn't think to do. And this is where the reference photos really start to come in handy because these are the ideas and the applications that are going to make the painting seem significantly more real than what it would have looked like had we just used our imagination because generally when we just use our imagination we simplify things. We make it a little bit cartoony just because our imaginations generally don't know the subjects as well as an actual picture could. And that makes sense because we don't generally have that much time to sit outside and memorize every little detail of a tree, right? So this again is where the reference photo comes in handy. It saves us a lot of time. I'm looking for a lot of these impressions. I'm okay with changing a couple of them. I still want to make it my own to a point, but it's through these that I know I'm going to create something interesting. Like look at the little piece that I'm currently painting right here. It's so strange. It's not something that I would naturally think to incorporate. And then it moves into something a bit more sweeping. That's interesting. Now I'm starting to run out of paint here on my brush. And you can tell because A got a little bit chalky at the bottom. You can see the tooth of the canvas showing through, but also because it started to get quite green. And that means the paint was thin and you can see the pigment of it more. So we'll mix more pigment. And I'm not going to mix too much at any point just because I like remixing it. I like getting in that habit. I like that practice. We'll just mix that up like that. Come back in, find an interesting piece. There we go. I'm applying as little pressure with my brush as I possibly can because the more pressure you apply, the more it's going to create a larger application because the bristles will start to push together and get larger. And we're really trying to avoid that here. You can go over the areas that ended up being a little bit too thin, a little bit too green. Currently working on this right here. I can tell there's a little break in the top, which is interesting. Make sure I incorporate that detail. And then yet again, we move into another sweeping piece, but this time the break is a little bit wider and it has some internal openings, which is neat. Yet again, I'm starting to run out of paint and rather than just scraping all of that paint about, I'm going to make sure that my brush is damp and reloaded. Now these connect at the bottom, which is interesting. This one still kind of flares out. We have some little pieces there. And then there's another little one that kind of works its way right underneath. So again, all of these details I naturally wouldn't think to put in here. But when you step back in the end, it's going to make it so much more interesting. Now I'll kind of double check where I was on the other side and I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between the sides. So that way I don't get too repetitive with either of them. Sometimes we can fall into habits of certain applications or strokes and by switching back and forth, you kind of ensure that each side is progressing reasonably together, but it's also going to allow you to step out of any bad habits you may be forming in those painting processes. 
So here, yet again, I'm jumping to the other side, and for whatever reason, the right-hand side is really calling to me, so I'm starting a lot of these over there, but you're more than welcome to start these kind of applications over on the left as well. Starting to get quite bunchy, and I'm now applying it over our trunk. And that's a really important detail to remember because foliage doesn't just grow on the left and right hand side, it grows behind, it grows in front, and we need to remember to paint and incorporate all of that. Now we're almost at the point where this is going to get quite thick and expansive, but that doesn't mean we're going to be void of detail. It means that the body of it is going to be quite dark, quite green. There are going to be a lot of openings, but the edges are still going to have all of that very intricate originality in them. So, back over here, just kind of figuring out where I was. If I skip a couple of branches, I am okay with that. Again, I like to work with a reference photo. I like it to give me all of these extra ideas that I naturally wouldn't have. But, I also like to iterate. I like to make it my own. There we go. Now, because of the way we've painted this, everything that is currently white here on the canvas needs to be covered up. And, that means that there might be little openings in here, like this one or this one, that would be here or here, but they're not going to be there now because we didn't paint that in. So what we're going to do, we're going to paint it fully in, and then if we want, we can take the colors from the clouds and work them back over and in a little bit later. But with that, I do want to get a little bit closer again for you, that way you can see that detail as best as possible through a couple of different ways. So here we're back to seeing, utilizing our water, and yet again, I think I'll need more paint. So we'll grab some sap green. About maybe a quarter of that in Mars Black, just because it's a significantly stronger pigment. And a very small amount of titanium white. Look kind of where we were. I'm kind of amalgamating some of these branches as well. Just to make them look a little bit different on my painting. Working on this area, you know what, it makes me want to extend this out a little bit more. And I want to balance the sides a little bit. Sometimes what you have in a reference photo, in a picture from nature, really whatever it is, it might be technically correct, but visually it could be improved, compositionally, detail-wise, and that's what I'm doing here. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have these ideas without this, and that's why I'm such a big advocate of using reference photos. Our next big painting is a really nice beach scene. There we go. Yet again, filling in all of this. And I'm not going to fill in all of the actual trunk. So here I'll leave an area open and then I'll cover the top and the bottom of it, but there's a small area that's kind of poking through. And it's difficult to see on camera, but it's one of those things that you could see and appreciate in real life. And I'm doing that to show that there are some thinner areas of foliage as well. So here I think I'm going to kind of follow the edge of some of our highlight Watching that, making sure that I do have these little pieces that protrude, that it likes to show me. And again, I know I'm talking a lot about the reference photo. You can, uh, you can find that up over on Patreon, along with the other ones, the full big version of the reference photo and the, the traceables alike. But here, it's going to get quite interesting. I'm using a stroke with this brush that's very tappish. So I'm tapping and I'm doing a little bit of a stroke. Tap and doing a little bit of a stroke. That way if any of my brush stroke shows through, it looks like it's an individual little piece and it's going to build texture, it's going to build a bit more of an interesting visual 
over time. And I'm also making all of my strokes, and I'll show you in just a second, so I get a bit more green in the mixture. There we go. I'm making all of my strokes in the same line or in the same pattern that I feel they will be draping. So if I feel like it might be moving up, I'm moving my brush up, and then if I feel like it's dipping, I'm moving my brush, and I'm doing it this way rather than doing filling it in, say, horizontally. Because again, if those strokes show through, I want them to really imply movement and little pieces. There I have a bit of texture that built up, and I like that a lot because it's in that direction. Get some more of our paint. Again, I'm kind of looking over at the reference photo. I'll leave this big chunk open and I'll just kind of fill in the sides here. Make this area a bit more thick and that'll show that these two areas are more open. And we're just starting with the base layer here, and then once we have it, we can start working on some highlights and different fun applications like that. On the reference photo, a lot of these are quite large over here. I'm going to incorporate some smaller ones just to break it up and give it a bit more diversity size-wise. So do a small one right there, and then I'll make a, a significantly larger one right here. And we're starting to move over to the rock, which is nice. Working into multiple textures and backgrounds. I'm going to take a step back, make sure that it's progressing evenly the way I want, and that the sides don't look too similar. That's another really, really important factor to consider when doing this. More green, more black, a little bit more white. There we go. Create a side over here. We keep, we keep putting priority over on the right hand side, so I'll put a little bit more over on the left while I have more paint on my brush. Allow me to be a bit more sharp, a bit more creative, and you can tell how similar this dark value matches with the dark value of the rock, and that's actually quite nice. I want this to be a little bit darker, but the fact that it matches means that they look like they exist in a very similar depth, and it'll just make it look quite natural again. I do want it to be a little bit darker because it's slightly closer to us, and therefore we'll have a higher contrast and less reflective light, but it's a good, good sign. So there I'm just adding some Mars Black. It isn't a pure Mars black, it's a, it's a mixture of the green, the black, and the white, but as you can tell, it's had enough of an effect to darken the pigment to be something that stands out a little bit more than the rock does. Head back over here now. working on this really large piece. It's a little bit stumpy. It doesn't have a lot that flares out on the edge, which is interesting. It's a bit more concrete. Starting to run out of paint and I started to drag it in. That's not the right way of doing it. If you do that, you'll end up with significantly thin applications in different areas. Make sure you go back remix the paint, it will make a big difference. There we go. Again, I'm leaving a large portion of the body of the tree open. And now I'm going to go back into this area and I'm going to create all of the little pieces that kind of dangle off all of the intricate pieces we couldn't render initially because we had so much paint on our brush that we couldn't get those sharp applications. It's another good tip when you are rendering detail. Try not to have too much paint on your brush because it can kind of clump up 
and make rendering detail difficult, where when you have just a little bit, you can make these sharp, smaller impressions, like that. More green, more Mars black, titanium white. And yet again, we need to fill in all of the white area. And I'm doing so with brush strokes that have a bit more pressure to cover more surface area, but I'm still creating strokes in the direction that the foliage would move in. And here you can see little examples of that. Of course, I don't have much paint on my brush, so we're not getting true applications, but it's enough to see the general motion and movement of the stroke. Starting to mix more and more paint as I go, because I'm much more confident with the mixture itself and I don't feel like I need that level of practice like I did at the beginning. There we are. If you wanted to speed up the process, you could definitely switch to a larger brush at this point and then just go back over the edges with the smaller one. And you know what? I think I'll do that myself. So. Here, I'll take my one inch flat large headed brush, get some of that green, a little bit of titanium white, a little bit of Mars black, same pigment we've been working with. And now just watch how quickly this all comes together. Of course, here I'll only be able to really apply the larger portions, but that's okay because they are just so significant. And the brush stroke, of course, is going to look a little bit different than that of what we were just working with. So you won't have all of those little details in there, but you can always go back over it later and incorporate those details exactly where you want them to be. Cutting along the edge of the tree and then coming back and filling out these areas. I'm still making the strokes, by the way, in the direction of the foliage, the way that I want it to kind of hang. That didn't change despite changing my brush. There we go. Now it looks like we're about to move out of the camera's view, so we'll change the shot and proceed. So here we are, a little bit of a different view, but I'm going to continue with the larger flat-headed brush, grabbing a lot of that titanium white, a bit of that Mars black, sap green, need to make it a little bit darker. I always try to keep a little bit of that color around the edge, that way I know what I'm mixing to. And now again, we'll go back and we'll essentially fill in a lot of the green here and I'll leave small portions open. So here you can see I left that little small portion, making those strokes in the way that this would hypothetically fall. Starting to get thin, and you can tell right there, just by how transparent it is, how much white of the canvas is showing through and making that green look brighter. And I'm not really deviating much from the areas that are currently just white on my canvas. I'll go back in and handle the details in a little bit. But there again, you can see just how thin it got. So we'll get some more Mars black, some sap green, some titanium white. And it's also important to note that right now, all of this is still quite wet. So this looks very different from this in terms of the actual type of paint, the material. It's important to remember that acrylic paints do dry much more matte, that they dry quite a bit darker. And so it'll take a little bit of time for this large area to look like it's cohesive with this other area. So don't fret about that. It's natural, it's just how paint and the process work. Going over a couple of areas numerous times to thicken those past applications. There we go. 
then just moving down. Again, leaving small areas open. You can probably see that a lot better from this angle. That one and that one. This will kind of wrap around the back of the tree, which is why I'm making that hard, sharp edge. And this brush is great for doing that. But this area, it's all quite simple. It's fully applied. There's paint everywhere, but it's not, it's far from done. That's what we'll say. So I'll we'll switch back to the smaller flat headed brush. I'll make a bit more of that paint. There we go. It's a little bit too desaturated. It's a little bit more white than I wanted, so I'll add some saturation, some sap green back into it. And now it's a little bit bright and a little bit saturated, so more Mars black. And that's essentially what we wanted. So now I'll go back in and I'll just kind of add this tapped texture to a lot of it. That way it's cohesive with the top of our tree and that way it all kind of looks like it continues and moves in that same way. It's also an additional quick layer of paint which will help thicken up any areas that need it. But this is really imperative to get that texture and that brush stroke consistent throughout that tree. So again, you can see it's much more quick than applying it naturally like this. Having that base layer done with the other brush really helps. But now we're just going in and adding a bit of extra texture, which is quite noticeable when a painting is wet and reflective as this is right here. I'm going to make a bit of a darker mixture now. Maybe a little bit more saturation as well. And I'll work this more into the middle of the body. And I'm doing this because this area of the tree is going to get the least amount of light. The edges are going to be receiving a bit of light. These edges are going to be receiving a little bit. But this back area is directly opposite to where the light source is coming from. And so to make this tree look three dimensional, we're adding these darker applications here to the back. And I'm letting some texture kind of occur here. So I'm applying a lot of thick paint and I'm not blending it out. And it's going to leave these strokes and it's going to make it look like it pops a bit because it physically is popping, which is a really nice technique I like to incorporate in the true foregrounds of my painting to make them feel a little bit more three-dimensional and a little bit closer to us. So here I'm going back, I'm just making that middle area a little bit darker and then I'm allowing it to dissipate as I move out into the edges, as you can see right there. But once I have that, and you can see my brush is relatively clean, going to go back to the initial green, something that's a little bit brighter and I still have a bit of that on the edge so I know how to mix to it. Just kind of matching what we have there. A bit more green, there we go. Now I'm going to come in and make those edges significantly more interesting. And I can work this slight highlight because it'll be a highlight compared to what we just applied back in a little bit so it'll look like that light is touching the edge and then it's slowly just working its way in as well. So it's multiple gradients, multiple textures we're creating here. But I'm trying to create very small applications, nothing notably large, using very minimal amounts of pressure. And you could use your reference photo for this area as well if you wanted to make sure that it was as detailed and realistic as possible. Here I'm coming over to the other edge, doing more of that. I think it needs to be a hint darker. There we go. Trying to leave some openings in the foliage. Create all of these nice little protruding pieces that are varied. Some of them might even stick up a little bit. A lot of them have this kind of drooping bell shape. 
it's important to look for common shapes to kind of figure out what complicated subjects are comprised of. And that way you know kind of the building blocks for them. It's important not to rely entirely on them, but once you figure that out, I think rendering them becomes significantly more simple. This is a, a great area for some nice detail. Now, I could definitely spend three or four hours working on just this tree and its detail alone, but I don't want the episode to become too monotonous or too long for you, so I'm going much more quickly with this than I would recommend you do. Take your time, again, evaluate your reference photo. I will go in and add extra detail to this in a bit more meticulous detail when I'm doing a layer of oil over it once I'm fully done. But if you intend on painting this as an acrylic and having it dry and finish as an acrylic, then again, I just, I'd just i spend a bit more time than what I am here working on these details. But I'm trying to show you all of the different techniques and ideas that can kind of come of this. With that, we're almost on the base layer, and soon we can start working on some highlights, which will be really fun. Just trying to make sure that we finish this strong. Give all of these little details the attention they deserve. There we go. This tree will kind of cross over into this one, which is always a, a neat effect. You can have some of these really go the distance if you want. Also connecting some of the branches. And let's have this one extend significantly farther out. Maybe this one too. These will be touched up significantly more when we go in with our highlights. But with that, I think the base layer is done. I'm going to let it dry fully and then we'll come in and add our highlights. I'm waiting for it to dry though. That way all of these darker colors don't blend with our brighter colors and just make a lot of muddy grays. So while I wait for my tree here to dry in the background, I'm going to use this time to clean both my water and my brush because right now they're both quite diluted. They have a lot of darker pigment inside them and if I were to try to mix a brighter pigment right now on my palette, a lot of those darker colors would get in there and I wouldn't get anything as bright as what I wanted. So it's important that if you do want a new really clean color and something that's not affected by your previous choices or mixes, make sure you clean your tools and it's also just a, a good habit to get into. You don't want any of that paint drying in your bristles. So I'm going to do that and then we'll get right back to the painting and make our tree three-dimensional, add some highlights and do all of that good stuff. So we are back. As you can see, we have some clean water, clean brushes, and our paint is just about fully dry. It's fully dry to the touch, but it still has a little bit of a sheen on it. So it's starting to match our background better, but it's not fully there yet. With that though, we can now proceed because again, it is relatively dry. And for this next step, we're going to start adding some highlights to the edges of our branches because the light is coming down, it's going to get the edges of this tree. And to make this color, I actually want something very similar to what we have here on the grass. That way it's cohesive and it all kind of fits together. Now, that's also why we're starting down here. That way we can kind of compare and contrast this with whatever we mix right there. So, 
Going to begin, as we always do, making sure our brush is nice and damp. Going to grab some of our sap green, move it to a new area on our palette, grab a bit of titanium white, like that, and a little bit, just a, just a hint of Mars black, because again, this will make it a little bit more gray, and we don't want anything too, too saturated. That said, we are now in the foreground where we can have things at the highest level of saturation in our painting. So I'll take this and I'll just kind of test it down here in our previously applied grass, apply it to a couple of areas to see how it kind of fits and blends in. And that actually worked really quite well. So now we'll take this, I'll find an edge of a branch, I'll go to the top of it, I'm bracing my hand on the canvas with my pinky finger, that way it doesn't shake. And with these little taps and strokes, I'll create these slight highlights down the edge to begin, as you can see right here. If your paint is quite watery and transparent, you'll see a bit of that black pigment showing through. And as a result, you won't have anything as bright or as saturated as it was on the palette, but that might not be the worst thing either. Kind of rein you in a little bit. And actually, speaking of in, I'm now moving inwards. I'm taking those pigments, and like the grass, I'm trying to leave little openings, but I'm allowing the paint to dissipate as I move over here to the left-hand side. You can see that it's getting darker and I'm not changing the pigment at all. The paint is simply just running out. And it's great because it makes it look like the light's hitting this edge and then it's dissipating as it starts to move in here. And that's really what we want above all. We want it to look like it's wrapping its way around. There we are. This is where we can really instill a lot of those extra details. Again, I'm starting on my edges, and now I'm moving in. I have a little bit of paint on the back of my brush, and I'm just tap that on to get a little bit more. I don't actually have to go back to my palette every time right now, which is nice from a streamline productivity standpoint. But I am starting to run out, so. I don't want to scrape this paint about. We'll start moving on. Grab more of it. Find an edge. Work that edge. Work our way in. And different areas are, are going to get more dark more quickly than others because there are branches on top that are going to be creating shadows. And that's important to remember. Here I'm using this very watery mixture to just create a subtle detail in some of the backing areas here. And I'm still trying to make my strokes in the general direction as how the foliage would fall. Here I'll have some of it go this way instead, which is kind of interesting, and then it'll meet up here, maybe it'll connect to this one, maybe this branch kind of goes in two different directions and then this one moves over it. Just looking for interesting little patterns like that. Mix some more paint. And of course, if you wanted this to look as realistic, as proper as possible, follow the reference photo to a T, and then add your own little pieces. Again, I use the reference photos for the majority of this painting. The only reason I'm not right now is so that I can make this lesson in around or under two hours. Not sure so far if that'll be successful, but I suppose you are being able to see the timestamp of the video. There we go. Now this area right here in the back is going to be significantly darker though, because the light is coming down this way, this is the back area. So I'm actually not going to let that be as bright as I made it. 
Just going to add a lot of water right here, see if I can take a lot of this off. We were relatively successful. It's good. To make that area a bit darker again, I'm just going back to the sap green, a bit more Mars black, hint of titanium white. And if anything, this should just show you that you really shouldn't be afraid of messing up or adding it in the wrong area. We can always go back and fix things relatively easily. And the more we do it, the better we get at it. So don't look at it as mess up, look at it as a, a learning experience. That's what I'm doing right here. Just get to build more layers, make it look three dimensional. It's all good things. Of course, this area is all wet and reflective now, so that will look brighter than everything else and a bit more saturated until it dries. So don't let that fool you. Now though, we will go back to our brighter mixture, which again has a hint of Mars black. Find the edge. And if I have a lot of paint on my brush, I might do two edges first, maybe three, and then I'll start working the paint back. But if I feel like I have enough to continue making these very sharp applications, I probably won't stop and start working it in just yet. Here you can see I'm actually able to do quite a, a number of these branches that I didn't expect to. There we go. Now let's work our way in. You can see that I'm frequently trying to combine a couple of these. Make them more cohesive and interesting. I think we'll have to move the camera up quite soon. Starting to run out of space. And here while I'm moving towards the back, I'm just letting the paint run out. That way I get this very almost gray application. It doesn't look bright. It just shows the texture and the movements. But that's very different from the applications over here. With that, I said we might need to move the camera. We might as well come down and finish the bottom area. So green, white, a little bit of Mars black. It's more Mars black than I wanted, but this bottom area will have more shadow on it anyway, so it should be a little bit darker. There we go. You can use slightly more water here at the bottom because it'll make the pigment more transparent. And that'll make it darker because you'll see more of the black-ish pigment showing through and it'll make it look like there are more shadows hitting these areas. And I'll make it quite dark here at the bottom. There we go. Now, slight highlights are going to hit this side. Remember, the light's coming this way, so predominantly it's hitting the right-hand side. Hints of this are going to get highlights because parts of this are going to be the front, right? And the front has highlights. So I'll mix up a bit more. And again, I always try to keep a bit on the edge, that way I know what I'm mixing to. I have a goal. So here I start at the top, more paint, start at the top, more paint, and the top. There we 
we go. Working it in a little bit, maybe there's an opening and light can kind of stream in through there. So this area will be a bit more illuminated. And now that I'm almost out of paint on my brush, I'm just coming in and delivering more of that same textural application that doesn't actually carry with it much pigment. Mix a bit more. Starting at the top, working our way down. I'm using a fairly watery application here too because I don't want it to be as bright as this side. And again, by just keeping it watery, we have more of that black showing through and it will look a little bit darker. So there are a couple of ways to mute pigments to make them less bright. You could actually mix them less bright or you could paint on the help of darker layers, use more water. When I was first learning photo editing software, like Photoshop, in high school, I was quickly taught that there were essentially a hundred ways to do any one thing you wanted to do. And it was about finding your preference in how it's done. And I think painting is very similar. You can paint a tree a thousand different ways, but it's all about finding the way you personally like to do it yourself. Just going to go back over a couple of these edges with slightly more of a highlight. Let just a couple pops come in there. But for the most part there, I actually really like how this turned out. So now we'll move up the tree. So we will now progress as we started using all of those similar pigments. It's a little bit too bright, a little bit too desaturated, so I'll mix in a little bit more Mars Black. Test that, and it's a good match. So back to the edges. When you're doing this, you can also if you're using a relatively thick mixture, make new additional little protruding pieces. So you can actually make it more complicated, more interesting in this layering process, should you want to. And I definitely generally like to do that. I feel like it's just a second opportunity to be inventive and to fill in areas we might not have paid as much attention to in the first application. Here you can see I am still sticking to the right, I'm running out of paint, I'm moving inwards. And then a little bit over to my left as well. There we go. It's amazing how real these branches can look when you have all of this extra detail. I think a real trick to painting realism in trees is just painting really large trees. Just on a big, big canvas. That way you have room for all of these little intricate details. And it would still look relatively cartoony if we essentially created the same pattern going down. But again, we were very cognizant about making changes having it adapt, and because of that, it's now getting to the point where it's as successful as it is. It's another subject that's certainly exceeding my expectations in terms of aesthetics, and that's always such a wonderful thing. There we go. Now let's head over to the right hand side, the left hand side. <laughs> Just adding a slight green highlight there, very watery. 
You can see I'm consistently taking a lot of those extra pigments off on the sides if I feel like I grab too much or if I just want to test how much I have. There we go. This will get a fair bit of light just because of where it is and how open these areas are that we're not going to be getting a lot of shadow from these top branches. But you definitely want the light to be most dominant on the tips and then as you move inwards it should get darker and darker because as you move inwards you get more of these casting shadows downwards. So I'm trying to go back and make sure that the tips and the edges are the brightest of all of the applications. And remember to keep this area close to the back relatively dark. And it's not truly the back. It's the back and then slightly over to the left hand side. Because the light is slightly over to the right hand side. If you wanted the shadow to be directly on the back of the tree, then the light would be coming from the direct opposite side of the tree. Here I'm just kind of jumping around, making sure those edges are nice and highlighted. Come back up to the top here. Now the top doesn't need too much just because it's quite small and when areas are very small they generally don't have as much surface area to have light actually wrapping around. So you might see slightly more of a silhouette effect, which is kind of interesting. But in the areas that I can add a highlight, I'm coming back and I'm doing that. But I'm not doing it at the risk or expense of making these details much larger. Here I will add a couple of little pieces that stick out though. There we go. And then, now that I'm starting to run out of paint, I'll just work these details slightly back up and into the rest of the tree. Making sure that everything has a nice little texture, just like that. And again, I will come back with a slightly brighter green. So just a little bit more titanium white in our mixture than what we used before. And I'll just kind of clip the edges of these pieces of foliage that, again, aren't going to have shadow from the pieces above them. So it's going to be a very minimal amount of an application. We're going to be very selective with which branches we add it on but it'll be this added detail that'll bring a lot more pop, life, and light to our painting. They can even be in here as well if you feel like the branch above it is quite small. And then it'll dissipate significantly as we get lower and lower because again we have the shadow of this that might catch or clip the bottom. There we go. We'll take a couple of steps back Actually, you know what, no. We'll do the trunk first at the bottom, then we'll take a step back and look at it. That way, it looks as good as it possibly can before we do that. A little bit, a little bit of a wider reveal. For the trunk here, we are going to continue to use our smaller flat-headed brush, which again is about a quarter of an inch. I'm gonna take some of our burnt umber, a little bit of titanium white, hint of Mars black, 
mix up a lighter brown than what we previously had here. And we still have our previous mixtures. I don't want it to be significantly brighter, so here you can see I'm using slightly more Mars Black, making that a bit darker. And of course, when we apply it to this, it'll be a bit more thin, and you can see those darker pigments show through. But that's a good start. And I'm going to start applying this to the right hand edge because again, like the foliage, that's where the light is going to be coming from predominantly. And then I'm going to work my way in and I'm going to do these taps that have openings. And this is going to be to create some bark. And I'm going to allow the paint to dissipate as we move up, that way it gets more transparent. You can see it just get a bit darker, that way it looks like there's shadow from the tree coming down. And then we'll also work it back into the rest of the painting in the same way we did the green in the foliage. There we go. Got a bit more. Do a slight line on the other side because again it will wrap around. Can come back in, add some extra highlights to this side. Just build up that texture. And if you feel it's getting too prominent, just use your finger and you can soften it, take down that value, do all of those good little things. You can also find little areas in the tree and just add slight highlights in them as well if you feel like they're poking through and kind of deserve a little bit of that highlight. But I think I'm going to move up, just add a couple more of these little highlights in the middle of the body, and then we'll take a step back and we'll look at it as a whole. So here's what it looks like from a couple of steps back, and as a whole, I am really happy with this. I feel like it was quite successful in a number of different ways, and you know, we should probably talk about those just so you know when it's, it's the way it should be. So first off, when I look at this, the first thing I notice and that I appreciate about it is that the textures all of the little brush strokes in here match that of the grass and of the rock in the foreground. So from a detail perspective, from an application perspective, from a textural perspective, I feel like it fits very cohesively. I also feel like we did a really good job with the color and the values because it does feel slightly darker than the rock that we have right behind it. And that makes sense because again, the farther away a subject is, the more atmospheric light it's going to get, the softer contrast it's going to have, and so it progresses into the foreground as it should. I also like how it has those highlights that are subtly on the right hand side, but they're, they're not too dominant. And if we were to make these all hyper saturated, all hyper bright, almost like what we have over here, then the eye might go over there because there's so much of it and just stay there and not look at the rest of this painting. So it's important when you're doing large subjects on the far right or left hand side of the canvas to ensure that the values and the highlights in it aren't so much so that they're distracting to the point where they lead the viewer off the painting or to the edge because generally you want them more in the middle. Now we do have a lot more of these trees to add so again those highlights would balance themselves out significantly more for sure, but it's nice that it's as subtle as it is to begin with, especially because you can always go back in and add additional highlights where it's significantly more difficult to go back in and take out highlights. So I really like that as it is right now. I think our next step is actually going back down into the grass, making sure that the trunk looks like it actually works into the ground and adding in some additional detail. Then we can work on some trees right up here in the distance because they're painted in quite a different way. So here we are, yet again, a little bit closer, and now we can focus again on those details. And this is something I wanted to do last week, but I just didn't feel like the time allotted it. So here we'll take that same smaller quarter of an inch flat-headed brush, make sure it's nice and damp, create a nice green like what we had in the grass before, so we'll mix that in our previous mixing area. Test that. Matches exceedingly well. And here I'm going to just take this and I'm going to start running it along the bottom of the tree here. And that way it's pigment 
overlapping the brown pigment, where before the brown and the black pigment were overlapping the green, and it looked like this existed on top of the grass, where now it looks like the grass kind of grows up the tree. And you can actually make a bit of a darker green, and you can incorporate some moss onto this if you want, and it's just a nice little trick and technique to move green up grass into trees and to kind of alleviate the awkward brown step that you have in between the green and the green. So you still have that brown, it's, it's, that brown, it's still prevalent, it's just not to that extent. And when I do moss, I generally like to make it a little bit less saturated than my grass. So I'll just do some little taps here. And there's a less saturated green. There we go. Then we'll come in and we'll make some highlighted greens. So we'll use significantly more sap green and titanium white in this mixture, less Mars black, and that way it stands out a bit better. And here, I'll just make a couple little tufts of grass. And I'm making these relatively vertically. And I'm going to place them throughout our grass here in the foreground. Now I'm making them with a similar stroke and application to that of the strokes that are already here that are kind of comprising the ground. So it's not going to look off in a application standpoint, and it's slightly brighter than all of the previous applications of grass, so it'll stand out to a slight extent. I don't want it to be dramatic, I just want it to be this soft little look. And then of course we'll have to move that out into the rest, and this will just be some tall kind of wild grass here. And this is really the finishing touch to the foreground grass that's really going to pull it all together. So it has all of these under layers that show the motion and kind of how the hill itself rolls and then this is the texture, the detail that shows what the subject actually is. But you can still see the other texture and the movement underneath it, which is quite, quite nice visually. Didn't realize the camera shot was as wide as it was. This is actually really convenient. You can just keep moving over. Need some more pigment, green, white, Mars black. Might be a little bit too bright, that mixture. So grab a little bit more Mars Black. And that actually looks better already. Now it's important to remember that we will be coming back over a lot of this grass with some shadow. So it doesn't need to look perfect now. You don't need to do all of it now because we'll be coming back and we'll be doing a lot of it anyway. With a slightly different pigment. just about at the edge of our canvas here. And I'm trying to make sure that all my strokes are a little bit different. Sometimes I'm putting them in clumps and clusters. Sometimes they're a little bit longer or shorter than others. And I'm trying to make sure that they're all done with purpose. And it's not just a bunch of little taps on the canvas. It's all taps with a purpose. And they were all made as a cognitive choice rather than just a, you know, oh, I'll tap a couple here, I'll tap a couple there. Think about areas, does it need more detail? Does it need less detail? Does it look too highlighted? Does it need a bit more of a highlight? Does it look balanced with the rest of it? These are all good questions to ask yourself in that process. But with that, I think now 
we will let all of that dry. We'll head back up, we'll work on some trees at the top of the mountains in the distance because again, they are made a little bit differently. And then we'll, you know, proceed from there. So jumping back into this, we are going to tackle this tree right here, which is right here on our canvas. But I think this shot is particularly quite interesting because now we can really look at an almost finished area of our painting and compare it to our reference photo. Now, a lot of it is similar. We have a lot of that shape and that movement. We have a lot of similar values and the general ideas are the same. However, we've taken a fair number of artistic liberties and I think this is a great area to kind of talk about them because I loved the clouds. I loved how soft that light was up here, but I wanted a little bit more detail happening right there. So here you can see some of those extra movements. You can see some extra texture right there. And that is an artistic liberty. It is doing something different than what the reference photo presents but still following the main shape and the main idea. The same goes for the tree where here you have a lot more green and quite a bit more texture than you do right here in the reference photo. And I think this painting would certainly not look as good as it does right now had I not used the reference photo. It made things progressively more interesting. It gave me a lot of ideas that I wouldn't have had otherwise. It helped me ensure that the depth from the back to the foreground was progressing really naturally. And I just, I got so much information out of it, but I wasn't beholden to it. I was changing it. I was making it my own through that process. And I think as we get to these end stages of a painting, one can kind of look at their reference photo and then look at their painting and say, you know, they kind of, I kind of strayed somewhere. It looks quite different. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. Don't get discouraged by that. I feel like we did a lot of little changes intentionally that in the end add up. And now, kind of look at this area, look at this area, and I, I prefer the painting. And I think that's because, you know, we put portions of ourselves in it. But, you know, the original piece is absolutely gorgeous, and I, I love that we had the opportunity to work with it. With that, though, we are um, now actually going to jump into that area. And I want you to look at this tree in comparison to this one. You know, kind of ask yourselves, what's different? Because that's really the question you need to ask as you work on subjects that are closer and farther away. And the answer is that this one is a bit more dull. It's less saturated. It has less of a contrast. So it's more of a gray and the values and the colors actually match more with the clouds. So what we're going to try to do here, we're going to try to create a slightly more gray tree for this area. We don't want as much of these stark dark pigments or these really bright green pigments. So we will begin as we always do, making sure our brush is nice and damp. I'm using my smaller flat headed brush here. I will start by creating the base of the tree as we do the trunk. So I'll grab some of my burnt umber, I'll grab a hint of Mars black, a little bit of titanium white, mix those together. And I don't want anything too dark because like the green foliage we'll be doing, the value still needs to be lesser than what we had here. So I'll kind of start from the top, kind of figure out where I want this, kind of peeking out of the top of the clouds, it's interesting. Applying a very minimal amount of pressure. I'm creating multiple little strokes, I'm taking my brush off and then I'm reapplying it. That way it's consistently moving slightly, it's different, it's changing. Grabbing more water. A lot of the same rules apply in the smaller tree that we utilized in the big one. And then I'll go and I'll make portions of the base a little bit bigger, that way it tapers in. And I might go over some thin areas, but up here I'm still being very delicate. I'm not applying much pressure at all, that way the bristles don't expand and I get that nice clean application there at the top. Make sure our brush is relatively clean. Now we'll switch over to a green. So I'll just start with some sap green, which of course will be far too saturated. We can't make it that bright and we can't make it that dark. 
So now I'll grab some titanium white, some Mars black. We'll see if we can mix something kind of in between. And I think that's actually quite close to what we want. If you put it in between this and this, you can see that it's really right in the middle, and we can give it a try. We can try it, of course, on here, where you can see that it's actually a little bit brighter. So you know what? We have our reference photo for a reason, let's trust it. Add a little bit more Mars black. Significantly closer. A little bit more titanium white again. Now, I'll look for the fun and interesting designs that we have in here. The top kind of has this little piece that protrudes. Then it comes down. There's this kind of wonky piece that flares out to the right, which is fun and has a lot of character. And then there isn't much there for a little while, which is nice. I actually like it when trees have a bit of an opening in them. And again, we have a bit more of a flared area. Just like that. There we go. Now remember that we're only using a single pigment right now, so it's going to look relatively flat. Much like the regular tree, we still need to build up multiple layers to give it that depth. So right now we're just kind of plotting its general movements. And as we get farther down, it's important to remember that the tree will get a little bit darker, it'll get more shadows because there are more branches that are going to cast shadows. There we go. Getting a little bit more paint. And then this area down here is really quite thick. You might want to leave portions of your trunk showing through though. That way, again, it gives it this extra level of inconsistency makes it nice and natural. Let's mix a bit more pigment though. So we'll start with sap green. Grab a little bit of titanium white. This is the pigment we're mixing towards. So now Mars black. And I think the pigment right above just has a little bit more green in it. There we go. It's a pretty perfect mix. Now, my tree extends a little bit farther with its limbs than this one does, so there will be a bit more overlapping action, but that's not a bad thing, that just illustrates depth more. There we go. And now to make it three-dimensional. Remember, the light's coming down this way, which means the edges are going to be the brightest, and the back is going to be a little bit darker. So here we'll just take a little bit of Mars Black, darken it even more, not much, and then we'll apply it towards the middle, but again, slightly more to the left-hand side. And we'll start there, and then we'll kind of blend it out with a bit of a tap, a little bit of a drag, similar applications to what we did in this larger tree, and more of it down here at the base. Might go up and soften the slightly darker top area right there. Don't want to do too much over to the right hand side, but you do need a little bit. Almost there. Just need to make the bottom slightly darker, so I'll add a bit more Mars Black there. Kind of start in the middle, work my way out. And you can see that that addition really didn't do much, but that's kind of the point. We want it to be staggered, we want it to be these very small changes that eventually add up. And so you can see I'm progressively just adding slightly more Mars Black as we go. 
making it a hint darker at every time. And I'd say we're almost done this little tree right here. Might have a little bit too much Mars Black on my brush at this point, so I'm just wiping that off. Go back to working with what I had. This area is quite wet right now. There's a lot of pigment. So it'll be blending into what we've previously applied as well. It won't be as dark as what we have on the palette or our brush. But that right there is a really good tree. It doesn't have as much detail as this, but it shouldn't because it's a bit farther away. It also doesn't have as much contrast or saturation. You can kind of see it almost blends here value-wise into the cloud and the same thing's happening over on this one. So I would actually call that a really successful tree in the mid-ground to distance. Again, not too much detail, not too much contrast, and not too much saturation, but all done with similar techniques and the same brush. With that, let's head down and work on a shadow from our larger tree. So now we're going to head back down into our shadows and you can see them right here in the reference photo. They are going to be right here in our painting and there are actually a couple ways of doing this. But before we get into the actual application, I want us to think about why the shadows are in the direction that they are in and should we change them? Because in our reference photos, the shadow is like this like this, and what does that imply? It means that the sun is on the opposite side of it, and that it's going to be kind of up in that direction. So let's ask ourselves, is the sun, is the light a similar, in a similar placement to what it is in the reference photo? The answer is yes. So we can proceed in that way, but it's a good thing to kind of double check while you're doing paintings like this from reference photos, because we do make changes, and sometimes that can affect things like shadows. With that, we did make a change that affected shadows. The largest shadow here is actually from a tree that's right behind this big tree. I decided not to paint that just because I feel like it's kind of awkward and visually it can be a little bit confusing. So I'm not going to do this larger one right here, but I'm still going to do this bottom one and I'm going to do the one that comes up and wraps its way around here. We're yet to do this tree but I have a little bit of the trunk right there, so I still know where it is. With that, let's go about our first way of doing this. We're gonna take our smaller, yet again, flat-headed brush. I'm going to mix up a darker green to begin with. So, start with a little bit of Mars Black, a little bit of Titanium White. We have a gray, we have some green, and now it's a darker gray, but it's a little bit too desaturated and we're truly in the foreground. So again, we still want this to be saturated. So I'll add some extra Mars black and some extra sap green. This new mixture just is void of more of that titanium white. And what we're going to do with this, we're going to kind of figure out where the shadow is going to be. And then we're going to paint those same brush strokes that we had previously incorporated with this darker pigment. So I'm doing both the vertical grass strokes and I'm doing the pieces that kind of move in the direction of the general hill. I'm going to be working around all of the ground and dirt that we have kind of established in this area. Just like that. And then it'll go to about right there. From there, we're going to go over to our Burnt Umber, get some Mars Black, a little bit of Titanium White, not much this time because what we learned from our last mixture was that the Titanium White was really something we wanted a minimal amount of. Now that I have this, I can go in and I can paint this right where we had our sand and our rock from before. And I think what I have here might actually be just a little bit too saturated, maybe a little bit too dark as well. So I will grab more titanium white. I'll mix that in, 
and now I'll go over those applications and this value matches with the other dark value of the green much better. So this is actually a great little change. You want the values of the greens and the browns in this application to be almost the same. It'll make it look natural and like it kind of coexists in the same lighting scheme. Go back, grab some more. There we go. And now we might want to go back in and work in some extra green and do slight blends on the edges in kind of the way we did initially. Get a little bit more of that sap green. Titanium white, Mars black. More sap green yet again. And I made my shadow area here really quite wide. And that was just because I wanted to make sure that I had a bit of room to play. But if you make your shadow too wide, you can always just mix up more bright versions of those pigments, like that of what you used previously. So here's a significantly lighter green. And we can say, okay, if the shadow is going this way, then this area might actually be a bit brighter. So here you can see I'm just reapplying that. And we can of course do the same with the brown. Now the next tree trunk is right here. And you'll probably want to go back in and touch this up. I just, I kind of want to do the other one first before we finalize this one. That way we can make them cohesive kind of at the same time. And I think this will be quite good for now. But going over to this one, I'm just going to paint in a very quick base for our tree. That way I know exactly where it is. Just like that. And the second way of going about creating the shadows, if not doing the same brush strokes as slightly darker pigments, is to take a bit of, say, Mars Black, a little bit of green, a little bit of brown, mix those up well on your palette, grab a lot of water, mix that in, we'll create a little glaze. So it's just very dark pigment, this kind of rolls up the hill, and then it starts to have some openings, it kind of flares out on the edges here, goes to about there, and the idea is that we're creating a very thin pigment, so you still see the detail and everything that's kind of happening underneath it. But you have a slightly darker value and something interesting happening right there. You can have some areas slightly more detailed than others depending upon how you want to do this. The reference photo has a lot of it quite vague, and there's a really big contrast in the reference photo shadow and the regular ground. So that's also something you should consider if you want. I'm going in with a slightly more green glaze for the grass, and then I'll switch it to brown after for more of the sand and rock. So now we'll grab more of that brown, a little bit of Mars black, a bit of titanium white. Titanium white is a very thick pigment, which can make glazing difficult because you want to make the pigment as thin as you possibly can. So that's also something to consider. Using a zinc white is a great pigment to glaze with because it's a much more thin white. It's much more transparent.
So now we have a mix of darker browns, darker greens, and we have a general darker pigment as well. And they're all kind of accumulating to make what we have right here. And I'm just building it up really slowly. I'm not doing any thick layers quickly at all. The more slow you build it up, the more control you have over the process. And the more detail oriented it can be. Remember that this base area is going to be much wider than the area over here. And again here I'm just slowly building up the areas that might be a little bit too thin or that I want to be slightly more dramatic. But either of these techniques work, they work quite well, sometimes they can work together. I'm probably going to do a combination of both. So here I'm going to mix up a bit more of the darker green that we had over there. and I'll work this into our glazed area with those same strokes that we used here. So we still have those grassy strokes. There we go. Again, mixing up more of that darker brown. We realized we needed more titanium white in the dark brown mixture than we did in the sap green mixture. I can test it over here, make sure that it is indeed what we want. Work that in. Recognizing that wherever we place this now, that area will be wet, and so we won't get a full thick pigment. So it'll probably be a bit more thin, and when it's thin, it shows the colors underneath, which are much more bright. So if you really want that darker pigment that you have over here, you'll have to either let it dry, or just apply significantly more pigment. Not move it around as much, because the more you move it around, the more thin the paint gets. I think I'll mix a bit of highlighted green here, create some grass that kind of overlaps portions of the shadow. So I'm just dragging it from that light area up over the dark. This will give it some extra depth, make this area feel a bit more cohesive. And I actually, I think I prefer the visual of the darker green grass. So I might make that slightly darker or slightly more prevalent than the brown. So I'm going back into areas that were previously brown and I'm just making them a bit more green. Still trying to keep my stroke consistent. Get that grass texture. There we go. Can work a little bit of that over here, just make sure we're using the same pigments in different areas and keeping things consistent. Go back and brighten areas, darken them if you want. Just play with it until it works the way you'd like it to. Want a little bit of a brighter top area now. There we go. Maybe I'll add a bit of extra texture in here. I think that actually made it look a lot nicer. 
We have a little bit of this highlighted brown in. There can be openings in the shadow as well. So make sure to incorporate small areas of little highlights here and there. Because they will poke through. Make them bigger, smaller. You can see lots of them in here. And of course we'll have to do that with the green too. This is where it all comes together. Looks much more natural. Let's take a couple of steps back and see how it's all turning out. So here we have it from a bit of a distance and I can tell you without a doubt that I much prefer the shadowy area right here to the shadowy area right here. And I think I do for a couple of reasons. The first being that this is just more subtle. I think the browns in here are a little bit more muted. I think the greens kind of blend off on the edges. And I also like the form better because I feel like this is easy, it's correct, it's a little bit of a line. But this, it's a shadow and we painted it like a tree, it works in a line. However, it's not just a tree, it's not just standing up as that one would be. It's moving over moving terrain, right? There are halos and divots and this should have movements and curves along with the ground. And don't worry, this is definitely something we can go back in and reincorporate, but it's a really important thing to remember that if you're not painting on a flat ground, that the shadow or the reflection of a subject is going to change. So let's jump back into that and I'll show you how we can kind of warp it to make more sense with the ground which it kind of projects itself on. So the first step here is kind of figuring out how the ground warps and it looks like it kind of comes up and then it dips in and then it comes up a little bit and then it moves down the hill. So we don't need much of a change, but we just, we can't have it completely straight. So I'll start by making sure that that same brush is nice and wet. And I think we'll do a bit of a divot in this area. So I'll mix up some brighter browns, a little bit of Mars black in there too. Let's try to keep it consistent with what we had. we will take out any of the shadow in this general area. So now it looks like it comes up, it kind of dips in, and then it goes down, right? But for it to dip, we can't just make this side brighter, we need to extend the darker area of that side. So, let's again mix a bit of a darker brown. Brown, Mars black, titanium white, and again, this time I want to mix it slightly closer to what we had over here. So I'll test over here. It's too light. I'll just take that off with my hand. Get a little bit more Mars black. It's a little bit better. So here, we'll just start working our path slightly more to the right hand side. And I'm going to take this pigment and I'm going to take it over a lot of the sand and ground that we previously did just because I like this value much better. So I'm just replacing those darker areas. Okay. Next, there's a bit of a jump here, there's a bit of a hill. So this hypothetically has slightly more up there. We're dealing with a lot of green, so we'll go to green, Mars black, titanium white. There we go. 
So now I'm extending this right there. So now you do have that dip. And then it's dipping yet again as it moves down the hill. So now we have a bit of movement and it makes it look a little bit wonky, but it's meant to be. So don't, don't shy away from that. Might also make this area a little bit more pronounced. Again, we want the openings, we want the highlights, but we want it to be a little bit darker as well. Here I'm just doing a little bit of blending the browns into the greens as we had before. With all of our mid-ground grass. Then I'll extend the shadow slightly. Lots of mixing here. I'm okay if the pigment changes slightly but we haven't done a lot of this shadowy pigment, and so I want practice. There we go. Now the body also looks significantly wider than this top area, which is going to make it more interesting. And I'm making this area shadowy, because the tree is actually going to go down to here and then we'll get a bit of that shadow casting there. I'm also going to make this slightly higher. Give it a bit more of a clean edge because that's something we did happen to lose through a lot of this process. There we go. And just as a, a little aesthetic tip, I find that fading the green into the lighter green looks much better than fading the brown into the lighter green. So I'm trying to make a lot of the dirt more centralized in the shadow rather than what we had before. So again, it's a little bit of an artistic liberty, but I think it definitely helps the general aesthetic of the painting. And this all, it's quite stark. It's quite dark relative to everything else. So I might go in and lighten it just a hint. And that's pretty easy. We just mix more of the color that we were using before. This time, however, we just make it slightly brighter. With a little bit more titanium white and probably a little bit more sap green to make up for the saturation that we'll lose in the additional titanium white. And I'm going to begin by working this along the edges that really softened it. I like that. It's making it slightly less stark. It's not a bad thing. It's still darker than the grass we had previously and I'm using lots of little brush strokes in here. I'm not just trying to fill up all of the space. So when you do see that darker patch kind of here and there, it gives it the same texture that the rest of the grass has. It doesn't make it look flat. There we go. The more we do, the better it looks. Which is, I suppose, how you really want it to be. Again, going in with a slightly lighter green, working this along the edges, working it in slightly. Just kind of building up that texture. This will make it look like there's slightly more openings.
my brush is almost fully out of paint, so I'm just going in and I'm adding a little bit of brush stroke and movement at this point. Nothing big, nothing notable. Here though I will add a couple blades of grass that are a bit brighter, that have that light kind of passing through. Speaking of which, the more I look at the brown, the more I want just a little bright spot in there. There we are. Making sure that pigment's consistent with what we have below and atop. It's a real process of going back and forth until everything just meshes. Also going with a slightly lighter green, similar to our natural grass, and then again I'll add those light spots in here as well. Sometimes connecting them, making them larger, sometimes keeping them smaller. Should be a lot more at the top, by the way, because it's so much more thin. And then those light spots just blend naturally into the rest of the grass in that general vicinity. So, we just put a lot of time and effort into this. I think the last thing I want to do is just soften that brown a little bit. So more burnt umber more titanium white, more Mars black, and when we soften it, we generally mean we want more gray. So significantly more white and black in this mixture. We'll try this. It's darker than the ground, significantly lighter than what we had before. We'll see if it works. Right? We don't like it, that's okay, we make it darker again. But I want to give enough of it a shot that we have a very honest opinion of it. Okay. You know what, I think I actually do like that better. Let's take some steps back, see how it's all turning out. So yet again, here we are with a wide shot, and now I think this actually shows some really significant improvements. I feel like it does have that motion that goes up, that goes down, that goes up, that goes down, and I think it looks significantly more natural now that we went back in and we added all of the extra texture and different applications rather than doing just the general glaze. So again, there are two ways of going about it. I think that both can look quite good. I personally prefer going back over all of the areas with similar textures and applications to what we initially did. And as a whole, I'm actually really, really happy with both of those shadows right there. And of course, it'll look significantly more natural when we add the other tree right there for that shadow. But with that said, I think what I'm going to do next is actually move back into the background, do the top smaller trees in the distance, then I'll move back into the foreground, do these three larger trees, and then the shadow. Though, I know that this video is getting a little long, so I think I'm going to end this one right here. If you'd like to follow along with everything I'm about to do, you can find the bonus episode up over on Patreon, along with the traceable and the reference photos. But if not, don't worry about it. We did do everything we're about to do. So if you're going to go and do these trees, just use that one as a blueprint. If you're going to go ahead and do these trees, just use that one as a blueprint. And then when you go to do the shadow here, again, use that as a blueprint. We've essentially done all of it. We're just going to go do more of it. We're going to refine. We might do a couple extra new little techniques, but 
that is essentially how we do those three different things. I hope you feel like you've really learned a lot. I hope you feel like you can walk out of this video with a lot of different techniques, especially about working with that type of foliage. I'm really, really happy with how that turned out. But thank you for stopping by yet again this week. It has been a real pleasure. I will see you next week with a brand new painting video. And, you know, again, just thanks for stopping by. I wish you the best of luck. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section down below. And above all, as always, stay creative. Hello, my name is Howie, and my favorite color is green. Oh, oh, and orange, because I'm orange, and I'm also my favorite. Green is special too, though, because it reminds me of the sweet green nippers. It's like an instant flop device. Oh, so comfy. Mom says,